Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Patrick Hatfield, head of the Animal and Range Science Department at Montana State University. And it is my honor to serve as moderator for the regenerative grazing session. First, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dave Scott has over 35 years of experience with intensive multi-paddock grazing, first with dairy cows and more recently 17 years with sheep. Presently, he and his wife operate Montana Highland Lamb with 200 ewes and 320 lambs grazing 32 acres of irrigated pasture in Southwest Montana. Dave is also a livestock specialist for NCAT. Our second speaker, Cooper Hibbert. Cooper grew up near Helena, Montana. He studied ag business, rangeland resources, and Spanish at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He's now the operation manager at Sieben Livestock Company, where he's the fifth generation to manage the family ranch outside of Cascade, Montana. Jeff Mosley works across Montana as the range management specialist for Montana State University Extension. Jeff is an MSU alumni and holds graduate degrees from the University of Idaho and Texas Tech University. Jeff works focuses on livestock grazing management, emphasizing livestock wildlife interactions, targeted livestock grazing to enhance wildlife habitat and collaborative conservation. Jeff is a past president of the Society for Range Management. Finally, just a couple of quick housekeeping uh, items. First, this session will, uh, like all others, will be recorded. Uh, attendees may ask questions via the Zoom chat window. We will try to address as many questions as possible after the last speaker's presentation. And if we don't get to your question, NCAT will follow up at a later time. Also, there, you'll see um, a QR code will be put up three minutes before the end uh, of the, the session. So those wanting continuing ed uh, credits can take a picture of that uh, QR code. So let's get started with our first speaker, Dave Scott. Dave, you're muted. Okay, here we go. Okay, that should do it. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be with you today. Um, and I really uh, hope that you can get something out of our regenerative grazing panel. Uh, my wife and I farm in Whitehall, Montana at elevation 4,200 feet. That's about 30 miles uh, east of Butte. Uh, we started in 1982 as a grazing dairy. And uh, we were immediately confronted with uh, having to figure out how to produce enough forage for 50 dairy cows on 30 acres of ground. And so what we did was we followed, uh, at the time Cornell University had a program called Rational Grazing. I think Jeff's gonna allude to this later on. Uh, Cornell kind of stole the name uh, from long ago. But so we did that for 20 years and, and then we switched to sheep. We have grass pastures, very little legumes in them. We've grazed our pastures for about four months or three, four months during the summer and three months during the fall and the winter as stockpiled pasture. We have 32 acres and they are averaging seven tons of dry matter per acre. We, what we do to determine this is we have uh, an NRCS hoop that follows the sheep and every five days we take a few hoops and get, get a dry matter production estimate with the hoop and then throw it in a spreadsheet and, and it calculates it for us uh, cumulatively. We run on daily moves, 43 paddocks are temporarily made for one course of the grazing cycle and they're made with sheep nets, electric nets. 
We also direct market our lambs to local restaurants, MSU University, and uh, one retail food store. So for us, regenerative grazing is just basically a functioning soil. And that's, that's the root of everything. And we, it's letting the plants run the show. They put out the root exudates, basically sugars to the, to the microbes. And, and ex, in exchange, the microbes bring back plant available nutrients. So all of our decisions are made with this premise of how do we make the soil more functioning? And so everything we do uh, is, is based on that and we sit back and watch the whole system. All you need for regenerative grazing to happen is sunlight, plants, water, and soil. And you add the herbivores, in our case, sheep. This picture here is taken about um, June 30th or so of this year, and you can see the tall grass. The sheep crew reduces fertilizer, reseeding, tillage, bare soil, herbicides, pesticides, and over the course of the last uh, several years, all those things have been reduced to zero through regenerative grazing. We still irrigate. We get about two to four inches of uh, moisture during the pasture season, and we supplement that with about 16 or 17 inches of moisture through irrigation. I might add that in 1982, our soil organic matter level was 1.3%, and now it's, it's sufficient or very much more than that. The crew also impacts upticks, species diverse pastures, nutrient dense forages. This is happening because of the, the relationship between plants and soil microbes. And that relationship brings back nutrients to the plant which results in a very nutrient dense grass plant, which results in nutrient dense meat and good food. The crew also increases the farm's carrying capacity and wildlife. Lastly, it increases ranch profit. So you can see our two, our two outcomes here are good food, which we sell and ranch profit. 2013 was a pivotal year for our farm. Up to that point, we had operated on 32 days of pasture rest, resulting in a fairly vegetative uh, grass when we, we grazed it. We were on daily moves with it's a fairly high stocking density. You can see it in this picture, there's about 740 sheep per acre there in that picture in, in the one paddock. Because the grass was so, so vegetative, there was little trampled grass because when they stepped on it, it was, it just bounced right back. Plus there wasn't as much grass there. So they ate down to about five or six inches. We've also always used compost um, for 35 years, composting the dairy manure and bedding. And, and then the last 17 years are lambing manure and bedding. So that hasn't changed. In 2013, we were just, we were happy with the way the things were going with the farm, but we had this nagging feeling in the back of our minds that, boy, you know, fertilizer was sure costing us a lot of money. And about that time, I, I was at a conference and listened to Gabe Brown and Dr. Christine Jones. And the gist of what they were saying that really hit me was, was you can grow grass without a lot of fertilizer if you do it right. And Gabe went further to say that with all, all these inputs, farming is fun again. And so that really, that really uh, rang a bell with me because I was getting tired of moving irrigation pipes seven days a week. And I was looking for a way to get out of that a little bit and, and not to running around with the fertilizer tote every month. So I went and asked Gabe how to do it. And he says, well, I can't tell you because it's your farm, not mine. I don't know anything about your farm. And so you've got to figure it out yourself. But he says, I'll give you a hint, increase your, your pasture rest. So that's what we did. We went from 32 days of pasture rest to 42 days of pasture rest and tried it out. That resulted in, in tall grass, which you can see in this picture right here. 
that grass is about 35 inches tall and it's, it's been allowed to rest for 42 days. You can see our sheep net that was put in and hasn't been stood up yet, but uh, that's how we keep the sheep in and the coyotes out, I might add. Uh, we have high stocking density that we kept along, but same 750 or so sheep per acre. And now since the tall grass was, or the grass was taller, we were able to trample much more. We were averaging about 2000 pounds of dry matter uh, per acre that we were trampling. How did we get the tall grass? We just waited one week to turn out in the spring. You can see in this picture here, there's about 1,700 pounds of dry matter to the acre there. Seven days before, it was around 1,000 or so. And so before, we had always tried to prevent headed out grass. And now we are trying to, to get it with taller grass grazing. Now we've always been taught, and rightly so, that that tall grass is, is much less, has much less forage value than, than shorter vegetative grass. And it's true, if you were to take a, a whole plant sample of this grass here on the left, you'd probably come out with about 45% TDN and, and 10 or 11% crude protein. But when we did this initially, I noticed that the sheep ate all the leaves and some of the, the stems here. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, they're smarter than I am. So I went and took a leaf sample, sent it off to the lab, came back 59% TDN, 17% crude protein. You can make some milk on that and put some gain on lambs with that. And our average daily gain at weaning has been 0.62 pounds for the last seven years. And previous to that, for the last, uh, 15 years before that, it was 0.625. So we only lost three hundredths of a pound in our, on our daily gain, which we can live with. Central to our management that imposes this whole system goal is high stock density, which is animal impact. It creates non-selective grazing because each one of these sheep knows that if they don't want, no, if they don't eat the grass right in front of them, their buddy's gonna. So the whole pasture is either grazed down or trampled. There's uniform distribution of urine and manure throughout the paddock and there's trampled grass. Here's a picture of the paddock that was just exited by the sheep. And you can see there's quite a bit of dry matter there left. And, and my great grandfather was a sheep farmer in Indiana. And if he was viewing this picture today, he'd say, good night, Dave, you left a lot of late wasted grass there. And 10 years ago, I certainly would have agreed with him. But now I've proven myself wrong because that wasted grass, we're using it to feed our microbes in the soil. And by feeding those microbes in the soil, we're not having to fertilize anymore. So our outcomes, we transitioned over a four year period from 2013 to 2016. And for the last five seasons, we've gone totally off fertilizer. We've gone from 160 units of of N per acre to zero. That saved us $125 an acre. Our fertilizer costs are generally in the realm of, of 70 cents a unit of N with ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate. Our irrigation has been decreased by 25%, both the energy costs and my labor of moving hand lines. Because now under this new system, we are on, we're on a 10 day irrigation cycle instead of a seven day. So there's, there's three days there every 10 days that we're not irrigating. That's saving us about $40 an acre. Our pasture production has also actually also increased from six tons to the acre to seven tons to the acre. And a lot of this increase shows up as stockpiled grass in the fall and the winter. So I valued this, this extra grass at $140 a ton, which is what the hay would cost if we had to feed the, the sheep that hay that the past stockpiled pasture took the place of. And so in the end, it gives us just under $300 an acre net increase by employing tall grass grazing. And so how did this happen? And the only thing we did was we changed the rest period to 42 days, which allowed us to, the plants to put exudates in the soil and allowed us to trample that grass. Here's a picture here of microbes in action. 
The vegetative green grass here is, this picture was taken August 15th. You can see about uh, 30 days of growth in the green grass there. You go backwards uh, 30 days to July 15th. In my hand, there is nice brown decomposing grass. That's what we like to see. We don't wanna see gray grass, we wanna see brown grass and it's decomposing. We go back 45 days before that, June 1, and you see nothing. And that's what we want because, oops, this is what it looked like 45 days before that. And this is what it looks like now. The microbes have decomposed it all. And so what regenerative grazing is increased soil function. And that's demonstrated by this slide here. That soil is functioning. And when you have so functioning soil, you've got regenerative grazing as a, a foundation of it. And with regenerative grazing, our, nat our ranch will never be the same. So thanks a lot, you guys. I really appreciate you listening. Thanks, Dave. Um, just uh, one quick question and uh, before we move on to Cooper. Um, what could you recommend to help mitig mitigate risk for those wanting to change their grazing management? Well, in our case, obviously it's a job, full-time job off the farm which is not a bad way to mitigate risk. My wife and I knew that if this new program in 2013 went totally south, we'd still be able to eat. Um, but if you have a, a larger ranch that does supply your income for a family or two families, I would just suggest that, that you try it on a small place, a small section of your ranch with the conditions that you stick with it for five to seven years and you have the integrity not to bail if something goes wrong and you meet a challenge because you're going to meet challenges. And if you can just fix those challenges with biological fixes rather than chemical fixes, you'll be on your way good. The other thing is uh, if you have the opportunity to direct market your product, that's a value added product. So that helps in that realm. One thing that we used uh, ex really a lot was the Haney test. Uh, we took a Haney test on the last week of June every year. And what that test does is it tells you what your, your nitrogen mineralization is going to be for the next 60 or so days. And we ended up over time really trusting that Haney test. If it told us that we had 90 units of N that was going to be mineralized from the end of June till the end, you know, end of August, we didn't fertilize. And if it told us that it was only 40, we would have fertilized. But each year, it it told us we were in that 90 to 120 uh, of it, uh, mineral mineralizable in uh, range, and so we just never fertilized. And we used that Haney test a lot. You know, we depended on it a lot. Okay. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, keep things moving. Uh, Cooper, look forward to your presentation. How's that, Pat? Can you see me and hear me and see my screen here? Looks good. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so my name is Cooper Hibbert. I'm the operations manager for Sieben Livestock Company. And uh, Sieben Livestock Company's a family-owned ranch. I'm part of the fifth generation. We're located in West Central Montana. And we're a high altitude, cold climate ranch with a short growing season of about 90 days. And our altitude ranges from about 4,300 to 7,800 feet in elevation. And if you were to map out our ranch's resources, we'd kind of look like an inverted pyramid. And it'd be in three tiers like this, where the, that top tier would be our summer zone, that's our summer ground. And then the middle tier would be our transitional zone and then the winter zone at the bottom. And so, as you can see, we're not balanced at all. We're, we're very unevenly weighted towards our summer zone, we have an excessive amount of summer grass and our winter zone is our limiting factor, that's our bottleneck. 
And the winter zone is basically what ends up determining what our stocking rate is. And stocking rate's an important um, figure. That basically means what stocking rate is, is the amount of animals that you can run in a given year within your ranch boundaries. And the reason that it's important is that it's your number one driver for ranch profitability, which will become, um, I'll delve into a little bit more as we go on here. And so in the interest of working with mother nature and taking this ranch imbalance into, into perspective, about 20 years ago, we changed our calving date from February and March to calving what ended up being June 10th. And we did that for two reasons. So one reason was to better match our cow's production cycle with the natural grass cycle of this place. Um, so that mother nature is meeting her seasonal nutritional demands and mother nature is doing more of the work and we're allowing cows to do more of the work and we we don't supplement the cows as much as we used to we take that crutch out from underneath them and the second the second reason that we changed that was it was just seemed like a better fit for our um, enterprises to our resource base when we're calving in february and march kind of felt like we we're sticking a trying to fit a round peg into a square hole and um <clears throat> and this just was a, a better match to our resource base and and uh it also helped us break out of the mold of being locked into calving in in february and march and having to sell our calves that following fall we now have more marketing flexibility that we did uh previously because we can still sell our calves as lightweight calves in in the fall or in the winter or as what we do to capitalize on that excess of summer grass what i had mentioned earlier we run our yearlings as as long yearlings um, and sell them the following fall when they're 16 months old and the other thing that it's made it that changing our calving date has allowed us to do is now we can winter graze our cows and so we're grazing our our cows that are four-year-olds and up and one of the reasons that it's made that a possibility is because since we don't calve until June 10th, our cows are at their lowest nutritional demand throughout the winter. They're in their second and third trimester without a calf at their side. And so we embarked on this journey about 20 years ago of um, along the same veins of, of wanting to do right by mother nature and trying to figure out what grazing management, what type, type of grazing practices work best for us. And I came home about eight years ago um, with an absolute obsession with grazing and grazing management and a real burning desire to just discover what is possible and um, really kind of accelerated the process. And if you fast forward to where we are present day, what we're doing is exactly what Dave was talking about, which is non-selective grazing. And the reason that we've landed on non-selective grazing and what non-selective grazing is, is that um, in a grazing event, we run at such high densities that every single plant is affected. And when every single plant is affected, it puts every plant on a level playing field. And the plants that outcompete in that scenario are the plants with the deepest root systems or the most amount of energy reserves and the broadest leaf areas or the biggest solar panels. And more often than not, those are our desirable species. And so we're effectively selecting for our desirable species by grazing um, in this manner. And a, some good byproducts of this type of grazing are the amount of litter that we lay down because any grass that is, or plant that is not grazed is trampled into the ground. And also an incredible amount of, of manure and urine and hoof action is distributed uniformly throughout that grazing paddock. And we've seen some incredible results from these grazing practices. This photo is of my pickup, which is a Tacoma, so not a full-size pickup. And those are dog ears in the back. And I didn't cheat. I wasn't crouching taking this photo. This is me standing up. Um, but we've seen an incredible amount of increased productivity ranch-wide from implementing these grazing practices. And we're essentially creating more life, which is in our bet. That's exactly what we're in the business of and it's in our best interest to create as much life as possible in all forms. And in so doing, we've, we've increased our ability 
to generate revenue. And so not only have we increased our ecological resiliency, but we've increased our economic resiliency. And so ranch wide um, in six years time span of started playing around with this type of grazing six years ago and really implemented it three years ago. And in that time frame, we've increased our forage harvest and production rate in both the winter and transition zones by 200%. And it also in our summer zone by 110%. And what those numbers mean, um, not only, if you remember what I said about stocking rate, we've essentially increased our ability to, to run more animals. So we've affected our, our stocking rate capacity, our ability to generate revenue, as I'd mentioned. And then on the other side of the um, economic equation, just in the winter zone alone, um, we're saving with that 200% increase in forage production, we're saving on average $85,000 a year in hay. And we've essentially increased our ranch by the equivalent of 2,500 acres in that zone. So we've taken our most limiting resource, the winter zone, and we've turned it into an unfair advantage strictly by changing our grazing practices, changing the way that we think and view what we're looking at and our ability to observe and interpret um, what we're seeing and also um, being willing to stick our necks out a little bit and take a few risks and experiment. <clears throat> uh, this is our biggest success story. This is a pasture in our winter grazing zone where in five years we increased our forage harvest and production rate by 485%. And in those five years that we did that, those were also happened to be the five driest consecutive years in the history of the ranch. And so we produced more with less. Um, and another very important part of the success story of what we've discovered with this grazing is um, the people involved who've really bought in are absolutely empowered. They see the effects of what they're doing with their day and um, have just this incredible sense of purpose and uh, fulfillment that drives them out the door in the morning. And so for us, what non-selective grazing looks like is this is non-selective graze on the right side. Uh, what you see splitting the, your screen there is a single strand temporary electric fence. And then on the left side of that fence is the, the graze, the feed that they have allotted for them that day. And so we start out at a water point and we do one day grazes marching away from that water point. Here you can see where the fence was to the left of where these cows were. There isn't a fence there. That's where we rolled up that poly wire to give access for that day's um, grass. This is what it looks like from a distance. This is in our winter grazing zone. And the water point where these girls are going to water is over on the other side of this, uh, that rocky reef, that cliff that you see. <clears throat> and this is how we landed on what we're doing is one day grazes. Um, and this is why, this is my uncle Chase standing on a, fence line of an experiment that we did. It's a one day graze, non-selective graze on the right and a two and a half day graze on the left. And then panning down in the non-selective graze on the right, you can see the amount of litter that's trampled into the ground and not and really pressed in into the ground to help kickstart that decomposition process. And you can see the amount of manure that's distributed throughout there. And this is what that same fence line looks like 30 days later. Look at that deep dark, rich, vibrant green on the right half as opposed to the left half. And there isn't much of a difference. That's a day and a half difference in, in stay, but that animal impact and the amount of litter and that amount of intensity really shows itself in the right side of the screen there. And um, that told me that that's exactly what this land wanted. Now I need to underscore that this grazing event occurred after two full years of rest. So after, after we graze, our ground will see cows for one day and then we'll be rested for 12 to 24 months. This is what that, let me back up here. Those dark green plants, that's a rough fescue plant, which is our desirable, one of our desirable species. It's a pinnacle species here. This is a rough fescue plant. Um, the following that July, a couple months after this grazing event, and to put that into perspective, that's my um, cowboy hat on the right with a five and a half, six, six inch crown. Um, 
And Pat, I believe I'm up against my time here. You want me to address this or hold off for questions? Uh, no, go ahead. We got a couple more minutes here, Cooper. Um, so <clears throat> I don't want to make this all sound like um, like there weren't any challenges. It's been a long road. It's been a hard road. Um, <clears throat> and some of the challenges that we faced are both from the social side and the animal performance and economic side. And on the social side, um, it's been mentioned in a few of the talks today. I think Dr. Daly was referring to it this morning of how, you know, there, there's a real uh, social pressure is, is real. We, we haven't really felt that. And I think part of that is because our desire to, to do right by the ground outweighs our fear of being ostracized by the community. Um, so the greater social pressure wasn't really a challenge for us, but the internal um, social challenge was, was real when we were trying to figure, figure out how to move forward and pushing the envelope. Um, and so getting everybody, we, we have a big team here. We're a fairly big operation. So getting everybody on board and moving in the right direction and bought in um, was a, a, a great learning experience for me. And, um, and I think just operating on the within everyone's comfort zones, but on the edge of the comfort zones is where I ended up landing. And that's how we constructed our experiments where we tried to fail, fail fast and fail forward and fail cheap. So we were set up for success and we could um, move forward appropriately with everybody still on board. And then animal performance, um, kind of what you'd like to do in grazing management um, and what animal performance needs, especially with a lot of the genetics that we all have, it's a very tenuous and polarized relationship. And so striking that balance between grazing and giving the cattle what they need um, ha has been a, a hard line to find to, to walk. And I feel like we're there now, um, but it, it didn't take long for me to realize that our grazing management had outpaced our genetics. And so we have a different focus on, on genetics and, and how we select our genetics and we have pretty well, pretty much everything structured to where mother nature selects for the, the genetics that fit this environment. And we more or less leave the human bias out of the equation. Um, and then changing our calving date to June 10th is awesome. Um, calving is a non-event, but that means we have to breed up in September and October. And that's what this photo is. This is breeding season and you can see what what's happening on the range and these range conditions are um, dropping drastically. And so um, trying to keep our breed back numbers where they need to be to where we're, we're economically sufficient has been a challenge. And I, I feel like we've, we've learned exactly what we need to do moving forward. So um, all that to say, it's like driving a sports car really fast. When you, when you can wreck, you wreck in a hurry. Um, so go into it with your eyes wide open. Thanks, Cooper. Um, just one real quick question and uh, kind of a, if you can give us a little bit of a, like a silver bullet here. Can you point to one thing um, that really was the catalyst that helped you uh, make the decision to change your grazing management? Um. <clears throat> I think for us, Pat, I, I believe it was two things. One is just a, our, our land ethic, wanting to do the right thing for the land um, to the best of our capability and trying to discover what that is for this place. And the second is, um, oh, and when I'm at the end of my career, I think one of the metrics that I'll use to measure whether or not I was successful is if I have something viable and exciting to pass off to the next generation. And what we're doing is exciting. And I believe that we have the foundations and the cornerstones in place for it to be um, most certainly viable. Uh, so that's the, that's the business end of it. Once I understood what these numbers meant, and what was possible from a financial standpoint, 
I couldn't not do it. Um, it's, uh, it's just a, it's good business. Okay. Well, thank you, yeah. Cooper. Really enjoyed that. Uh, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Well, can you share the other screen, Jeff? There we go. I think we made it. Perfect. Thank you. That worked. And volume's okay. We'll go ahead then. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Jeff Mosley, as Pat said, and I work at Montana State University. And my role in this particular presentation panel is mostly to be cheerleader for uh, Dave and Cooper and uh, maybe try to back up things that they've all illustrated already with, uh, with science and show that uh, it really is real. We know it's real. We know it's real, you know, by watching what Dave and, and Cooper and others are doing. Uh, we also know it through research, so when you need to go talk about it with somebody, maybe to your family, maybe to your banker, uh, maybe to your neighbors, um, you're not alone and, and there is information to, to back things up. Of course. Hmm. It's not advancing on me here. Not sure if you can help with that, Jason, or not, but for some reason. Uh, go ahead and try uh, click into the window of your PowerPoint there real quick and hit the escape key on your keyboard and see if we can't pop it out. In the show and start over, you mean? Yeah, try that again or try that and see if it helps. Okay. And you'll have to reshare your screen again. Let's try that. Let's try this. Okay. Hey, working. there we go. Love the support. So, one of the things that uh, I think a lot of people struggle with is uh, this kind of fundamental concept about what grazing is and how it works. Um, a lot of people have the idea that you know, less grazing is better and nothing could be further from the truth. A lot of people think that more grazing is better and to a point that's true, but at the other end of the spectrum that could, is furthest from the truth. So it's the idea that Ecosystem health and productivity maximizes at an intermediate point of herbivory or grazing pressure. So there's such a thing as too little grazing pressure. There's such a thing as too much. And what you're trying to do is find just the right amount. And that just the right amount of grazing pressure is where ecosystem health and productivity is actually maximized. Now the scale of that graph depends on the system, right? Depends on, on your environment. What is too little or what is too much depends. But this fundamental concept is true and it's the Goldilocks principle, you know? Everything you always needed to learn, you learned in kindergarten or before, right? This concept of just the right amount, the porridge is too hot, the porridge is too cold, and then it was just right in the middle. Right? And then the corollary to that is too little, or too much of a good thing is a bad thing. But this isn't a fairy tale, okay? And we all know this by our personal experience. There are lots of things in nature that are like this. And if we just look at our own human experience, things like exercise, too much of that, not so good. You wear out your body. Too little of that, not so good either. Sleep, healthy food, clean water. These are wonderful things, right? Too little of them, not so good. Too much, not so good either. This is real and grazing is the same. So how do you know, all right, what are you trying to achieve in order to maximize the ecosystem productivity? 
Well, this comes back to those fundamental ecological processes. When the ecological processes are functioning as well as they can for that given environment, you are at the maximum amount that that ecosystem can produce and be and its fullest health. So the things to look for, right, are the water cycle, and we've heard a lot about these all yesterday and today, the water cycle, the energy flow, and the nutrient cycle. And as both Dave and Cooper were pointing out, that's where their focus is. They're trying to think about these things and think about what they're doing and how it affects these three primary ecological processes. So how does this really work? I mean, how does just the right amount of grazing maximize these ecological processes? And you've heard this before and you've just seen evidence of it, right? And you can look through that list, but it's all about affecting those processes, affecting photosynthesis to increase energy flow. Uh, it's about increasing root growth and root exudates to increase soil microbial abundance and efficiency. You know, so those, those microbes, they're not spending as much time and energy respiring. They've got to do that, but they're going to put more of their effort and function more efficiently uh, to reduce methane, to reduce carbon, to reduce and decompose nitrogen and keep those things moving so that more of all that is tied up in the plants, in the soil, in the soil microbial population, and less in the atmosphere. So all these things that, that folks have been talking about the last couple of days, grazing does this. It's a natural process, and we are just taking advantage of this wonderful, amazing natural process. Right? And if we do it right, we can actually make the environment healthier and more productive than if we didn't do it at all. Right? So a couple of things to keep in mind. First is the right amount Okay, this idea of the Goldilocks principle, the right amount, it is site specific, right? Uh, Dave pointed out, you know, Gabe Brown said, I can't tell you, I don't know your, your place. Right? It is site specific. And then as conditions change over time, then the right amount has to change. But it's really not the right amount, it's actually the right combination. And anybody that's, you know, worked with grazing knows that grazing management comes down to managing four things, right? When the grazing is applied, how much vegetation you remove, or maybe more importantly, how much you leave behind, how often you come back to it. And then as Cooper was just pointing out, how uniformly the grazing occurs makes a big difference. And it's, a, it's different between if, if two different plants next to each other, if they're both grazed, that has one impact. If one is grazed and another's not, that obviously has a different impact. And if these are different species, right, in a mixed species rangeland setting, that creates, when they're all in different phenology and stuff, that creates differences. And then even individual tillers, if you take a bunch grass, say, and some of those tillers are defoliated and some are not, that's a completely different plant response than if all the tillers, individual tillers on one bunch grass are uniformly grazed. So these are the things that we're trying to really manipulate or manage uh, when we graze. And one of the greatest challenges of all this is that these are not independent. So the right amount, the right combination depends, you know, how much is too much, how often is too frequent, right? How early is too early or too late? Well, that depends on the other three. So anytime you tug on one or you adjust the other one, then the other three, you have to reconsider those. So a lot of people get into, into trouble when they focus on only one of these and recognizing that the right amount, not only is just right for your place, but it depends on these others. So it's a package deal. And I would encourage everybody to think about it that way. Okay? And then, as both Dave and Cooper alluded to, it gets a little more complicated because so far all we've been talking about is this ecological optimum, the biological part. But once you start bringing in other considerations, you know, the other two legs of the sustainability stool, right? The financial part of it or the social part, 
Well, that means that the optimal combination probably changed. Right? If you just are thinking about the ecological optimum, the optimal solution, the optimal combination of timing, intensity, frequency, and selectivity, there's that. But then you start adding in these others, and the optimal combination is different. And as those conditions change, you know, your kids get older, you want to be able to go to a basketball game, or you want to be able to go camping, or whatever, or dad can't help ride anymore. So now I have to change what I do. All kinds of things can enter into that, right? So then you have to adjust. So some people get really frustrated with this. You know, the optimal combination is always changing. But as Cooper just said, my gosh, that's the beauty of it. That's the fun, right? It's never boring and it never will be, right? So the people who really enjoy this and who really do well, they embrace that. Right? And if you want to be in a system where, you know, blue plus yellow makes green every time, well, this is not that, right? But this is really exciting and, and challenging. And at this level that we're talking about here, as, as Cooper said, it stretches you to really be on top of all this and to be continually watching and learning and adjusting. There's one result of this though, and that is that we're never actually going to be at the optimal solution because as the conditions change the optimal solution changes and we're always a little bit behind that could be kind of frustrating for some folks right but i would look at it this way right even though the perfectly right combination is, is unattainable i would follow the great advice of vince lombardi right gentlemen we're going to relentlessly chase perfection knowing full well we will not catch it because nothing is perfect. But we are going to relentlessly chase it because in the process, we will catch excellence. So the idea that in pursuit of perfection of that optimal solution, we're going to be able to find excellence and do a pretty darn good job. Right? I'd also like to remind people that, that, you know, if you need some faith in remembering that this is not the first time people have done this, you know? I mean, indigenous people in Western United States have been managing the land for about 13,000 years. The oldest known remains uh, are from a burial site are located right near my house. There were people here walking around in our place and for 13,000 years. And then if you think back into uh, the Middle East, and Mongolia, there have been nomadic people that were using short, brief periods with sheep and goats. And then that came to the Western United States through sheepers and the, and the Basque culture. I first got exposed to that in 1979. Bottom left-hand corner then, Alan Savory uh, promoted a lot of these principles. I first heard him speak in 1978 and, and we've learned from him. And then this gentleman here in the bottom center part, uh, that's André Voisin, and uh, he's a Frenchman. He's passed now. He passed away in 1964, but he wrote a book in 1957, provided a lot of the, the basis for what Alan Savory picked up on then and fine-tuned. Uh, it was then went into, uh, translated into, into English in 1959, but in his book, he recognizes this uh, brief small publication that's in the bottom right corner of the slide, that's a, a French publication that appeared in 1760. In 1760, people were already writing down the principles of high density rotational grazing. So it's been around a long time. We're fine tuning it all the time, but it's not, it's not foolhardy, right? And over time, then people have tried to you know, come up with ways to describe it, to teach it, to learn from it. It's gone by various names. And uh, as Dave alluded to, André Voisson, he, uh, he had called it rational grazing back in 1957. And I really like this quote from him that in his mind, that's just synonymous with good grazing. So whatever you call it. Right? But the principles then that, that 
Dave and Cooper are using and have highlighted, you know, are, are listed here. The grazing periods are short enough to accomplish a few things. They're long enough to accomplish a couple others. The stock density is high enough to spread those benefits across the paddock, right? And then finally, I want to wrap up by talking here about HUG versus HPG, because in my experience, this is where people have struggled the most in trying to implement these. So they're, these are South African terms. And it's just pointing out that there are two different ways to approach high density rotational grazing. High utilization grazing is the idea that, that both Dave and, and Cooper are applying. It's the, kind of that lawnmower approach. Okay, trying to get really high stock densities so you get really high uh, uni uniformity in the grazing. A different approach along the same lines, and, uh, and it goes by the same names as re, you know, short duration grazing, but it's a different approach, is high performance grazing. And in this setup, the idea is to be at a high density and rotate, but to only be in a pasture long enough to kind of cream the crop, cream the top off, and then move, okay? And where I've seen people come into real difficulties is when the two get mixed. So high utilization grazing works really well, as Dave showed, you know, irrigated environments, sub-irrigated environments, further, you know, into the Midwestern United States and Eastern United States, real short grazing periods. And then you can come back, you know, a month or a month and a half later and rotate around. And to do that, it takes, you know, about 13 to 43 paddocks. Okay. You can use that, of course, on semi-arid upland rangeland, just as Cooper's doing. Okay. He's using one day rest or one day grazing periods. But he is waiting, you know, a full year to two years before he comes back. And so on semi-arid upland range level, where a lot of people go wrong or have difficulties is they go into HUG, but the rest period is not nearly long enough because they are applying it as if it was high utilization grazing in an irrigated environment. And we have people, you know, just seen in, in our state and, and across the West that are using HUG in both irrigated environments and semi-arid upland environments successfully, beautifully. We also have people using high performance grazing, right? High density, not as high, a little longer grazing periods, a little shorter recovery periods than, than semi-arid HUG, and it only takes six to eight paddocks. And so I just encourage you to maybe that's a, it's anyways, it's proven really helpful to me to think about uh, some of these differences that way. And that's all documented by research as well as years and years of practice by wonderful practitioners like Dave and Cooper. So with that, Pat, I'll uh, turn it back to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I've got one question and we'll try to get through some of these chats. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get them all covered, but NCAT will reach out and uh, try to get uh, people's questions. Lots of really positive comments. I'd like to compliment all the speakers. Uh, Jeff, one thing that uh, we've touched on, but uh, if you could kind of that 30,000 view, uh, how do you monitor your management to get the information you need to feed into your adaptive management plan enable, and enable you to reevaluate, replan and reapply? Okay. Um, you know, lots of different ways. In fact, we've just had some talks here this afternoon about different ways to do that. Um, the way that, that I've used the most and the simplest that I know of uh, goes back to rangeland health indicators. And rangeland health is a, can be a, a fairly complex thing. The, the, the rangeland health book interpreting indicators, rangeland health is 120 pages. We've been able to uh, reduce that down to a single page. Um, that we use with producers. We have one for uplands and one for riparian areas. And uh, it basically looks at things on the ground, above ground, that you can look at that are indicators of whether or not the three primary ecological processes are functioning and how well. And, and it's proven to be a very simple tool uh, that keeps your focus on those ecological processes and provides you near instant feedback. And once you start your eyes trained to look for those things, you can never shut it off. And you don't need the checklist anymore because you're 
you're continually running that through your head. Um, and I think that that's been very, very helpful for me and in, in my work with other folks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think one really uh, kind of a, an interesting question from the chat, probably more for Dave on the irrigated ground. Um, Dave uh, saw a lot of grass, a lot of good grass, but uh, uh, not so much legumes. Can you uh, um, tell us what the what you were thinking there? You're muted, Dave. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one that we've been struggling with for 20-some years. Uh, we've planted legumes, and they, uh, they kill out in our winters. Um, and so uh, we haven't reseeded in 15 to 20 years uh, any of the fields or paddocks in our pasture, and we're not going to reseed just to get legumes in there. Uh, our philosophy now is we know the seeds in the soil and if we can adjust our management so that it favors legumes to, to emerge, sprout and, and stay alive, that's what, that's what the tact that we're doing. Uh, one thing is too, is uh, I've come to not really worry so much about not having legumes in the pasture anymore because we are, our microbes are fixing in without them or else we'd have to be adding fertilizer or else our organic matter would be going down. And actually our organic, organic matter is going up every year. And so we're okay. And I'm just, I'm just willing to let the legumes come in at their own rate. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I think one other uh, interesting point about that is uh, when you have 17% crude protein, you're meeting the nutritional needs of those ewes. Um, Cooper um, and anybody else who'd like to chime in, I think this is something that comes up a lot. So Cooper, uh, you said uh, uh, genetics for the environment. And uh, um, somebody said, I haven't heard that before. And I think there's an interesting discussion there about if you look at that ruminant as a tool, you know, matching the tool to the environment. And I, and I always think about, we have the production environment, but we also have the market environment. So how do you, uh, how do you balance those two? That's a, that's a great question. And I don't really necessarily know how to answer that because so far we haven't come out of balance on the, um, let's just say the the carcass trait and on, we have a, a number of different outlets for our own genetics to kind of truth how we're doing um, throughout the whole chain of this, um, of our cattle's lives. Um, we see how they do on the ground and the genetics for this environment is incredibly important. Uh, I'm of the opinion that genetics have been selected for different criteria than what we need here on the ground in order to be profitable here on the ground. And also in order to, Pat, what you kind of alluded to, do the type of grazing that needs to be done um, and not have it break the bank, have the cows thrive under those conditions and not have them be pushed too hard. Um, but we, so we're doing the type of grazing management that needs done on the ground in order to prove everything um, in order to prove our, our land resource. And we're, we have some grass-fed beef outlets. And so we get, um, we see how, how our genetics perform in that type of an outlet and they do incredible. And then we also retain ownership on them through a short fed program, um, through a feedlot that they end up and then go on to Whole food stores and we get the carcass data back on them and they're in the top 1% of the cooperative that they're involved with. And so we, I know that there's a balance there, but I haven't really had to juggle that yet. So far we're doing fine. Right. Thanks Cooper. Uh, Jeff, there was one thing, uh, I think this would be great. Somebody asked if you could uh, get a copy of your one page assessment. Maybe you, we could share that with Dave and NCAT could help uh, get that spread out. I think uh, yeah. 
boy, it's 255. So I think we're at the end. Um, I'd encourage all the speakers to look at the chats. There's some great questions there, some really uh, appreciate all the wonderful comments.